avoiding unnecessary distractions and junk scholarship, I guess is what I've entitled it. My point is simply this, that here we are, we're a group of people that represent numbers of different congregations or communities. Uh, we call ourselves by different names. We try to sometimes get together in, in so-called denominations. We have a lot of alphabet groups. We have UMJA, UMJC, MJAA, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, why is it that we have so much splintering? Well, I know that, the, that one of the issues relates to identity. Okay, that's become more of a primary issue in the last five years than it was before. Uh, some of the groups have become emboldened to come out and actually say Messianic Judaism is for ethnic Jews. You Gentiles, thanks but no thanks. Go back to the church where you belong. That's caused a lot of grief. It's caused a lot of trouble. It's caused a lot of confusion on both sides of the fence. The majority of us are not saying that. Some are trying to go in between, saying, you know, we want Jews to be seen as Jews. We want Gentiles to be seen as Gentiles. As a result, you're welcome to come, but your son can't have a bar mitzvah. We're not going to call you to the Torah. Uh, we'd rather that you didn't wear a kippah, or if you do, that you take it off when you leave, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we know that this, this was the case in the first century, because in the at least as early as the first century, because the Mishnah as well as the Talmuds go through, a, in the tractate Berchot, go through the whole question of whether a convert can say God of our fathers. And the conclusion is that the convert has to say God of your fathers. So even in the prayers, they made a differentiation between those who were naturally born Jews and those who were not. Um, and yet, we can identify all of these various things that divide us, that cause uh, us to question whether we can fellowship with this group or that group. We can, we can go through all of these things, but ultimately, I think, it comes down to the f that we are a movement that is, has a dearth of honest scholarship. It's not only us. The same thing is happening in the Christian church. You know, in the 80s was the battle for the Bible, which, by the way, we lost. I don't know if you realize that. We lost that battle. Uh, rationalism from Germany that started 80 years early, before or more finally caught up with us, and we had become so dumbed down that we didn't know how to ask questions. We didn't know how to think. We simply accepted what the professionals have told us, and as a result, the Christian church slipped into the demise of postmodernism and... And here we are. The Messianic movement of our present day had its roots very much earlier, but its actuality began somewhere in the late 50s and early 60s with the Chernoffs and with others coming out of the old Jewish Christian mission and coming to a realization that believers in Yeshua who are Jewish could actually use their Judaism as an effective tool for evangelism. They thought if we stop meeting on Sunday and we start meeting on Shabbat and we start having a Torah scroll and we eat a little, at least we eat kosher on Shabbat, then there's going to be some Jews that are going, wow, look at what's going on. Let's go see what this is. We hook them in with our Judaism and then we tell them about Jesus. And when they came in and got told about Jesus, you know what the, the most of the Jews did, said? You guys are deceitful. You should have put a big sign on the door saying, we want to lead you to Jesus. You were Jewish only in part because you wanted to draw us in, and it backfired. And what happened instead was that a whole bunch of Gentiles came in and loved it. <laughs> and so by the time you come to the 70s and the 80s, you have most of the, of the Messianic congregations that are being cropping up in the United States and elsewhere are populated mostly, mostly by Gentiles. It caused a problem. Now these... All of a sudden, these Jewish believers said, wait a minute, I thought we did this because we wanted to bring our Jewish brothers and sisters to the Lord. And here we have all these goyim. They don't want to be Jews with us. They don't want to do the things we do. What do we do now? And so and I'm giving you a very large overview picture. And so it began to say, maybe we should require certain things of the constituents or the members. And if they're not willing to comply, we tell them goodbye. So there was the break between the UMJC and the MJAA and so forth and so on. One wanted to be more orthodox, one didn't care to be more orthodox, and, and you begin to see these divisions. 
until you finally come to the time where, where uh, uh, Stuart Dowerman and Mark Kinzer and uh, others within the UMJC are saying we need to revert to the idea that Messianic Judaism should be thoroughly Jewish. There may be some Gentiles called in to be part of us, but the majority of the Gentiles, that's, this is not for you. And that left a huge problem. What are we going to do with the body of the Messiah divided in two? And so, as is very typical of good rabbinic scholarship, Mark Kinzer comes up with his bilateral ecclesiology, saying that it's really one body of the Messiah, but it's two compartments. There's an upstairs and a downstairs, or however you want to say it. You know, it, it's, it's a duplex, okay? It's a duplex. One house, but it's a duplex. Two families living, Gentiles over there, Jews over here, and we're fellowshipping one body in the Messiah. Really first class. Yeah, first class, I know that. First class, second class. And you, you ask yourself, how did this all come about? I know this sounds too simplistic, but it's because not so much my generation, maybe a little bit, but the generation that followed me and the generation that followed that have been educated primarily in institutions, and I'm talking about public education, who have taught you what to think, not how to think. I cannot believe the, the vulnerability and gullibility of general population in our day. I mean, some guy gets on the television and said he saw an eight-story figure of Jesus who said, if you don't get eight million dollars, I'm going to kill you. And then in the next year, he gets eight million dollars? Yeah. Some guy says that uh, the rapture is going to happen on, what was it, May 21st? He said the same thing back in 1994. You know how much money was sent to him between 1994 and May, 1st, May 21st of 2011? 177 million, no, 174 million dollars. Now, all I'm saying is that either we have a dumbing down of an inability to think through things and or, and it's probably both and, we have something going on in the end times, if we are indeed in the end times, that in which people are deeply deceived. I would suggest to you that the Messianic movement that had its, our current Messianic movement that has its roots in the 60s was primarily born out of the charismatic renewal, so, so to speak, that was also current in the 60s and 70s. It was the first time that the charismatic doctrines infiltrated Roman Catholicism, for instance, or infiltrated large mainline churches of, of uh, the Episcopal and Presbyterian Church. It was much, much broader than the so-called charismatic movement of the earlier 1900s. The Messianic movement was born out of the Charismatic movement. I don't know if you all realize that or not, but the Chernoffs and the others that are with them all were part of the Assemblies of God and all part of that Charismatic movement. Now, the Charismatic movement has brought some very wonderful things, and I don't want to bash anybody. But one thing that the Charismatic movement didn't do, at least initially, was have any regard for scholarship. They were not concerned about the study of the Bible. They were far more concerned about the subjective experience of the spirit. And as a result, we have, think about it, people. Okay, it's 50 years ago that this whole thing started. In 50 years, we should have had schools established that were, that were teaching leaders. We should have produced a commentary on the whole Bible from a Jewish messianic perspective, Hebraic perspective that was good quality. You know, we don't even have a chumash. We've twiddled our thumbs and gone along with our uh, whatevers and we have made very little progress in terms of moving forward on... I mean, if you do the study, and it's worthy of the study, if you study, for instance, the history of the Presbyterian Church in America, I just picked them out, but the same thing is true with the Methodist Church, the same thing is true with the Lutheran Church. When the Presbyterians came to America and said, we want to establish the Presbyterian Church in America, what did they do? They founded seminaries. Boom, Princeton. 
Westminster. Major, major amounts of money, effort, and time put into saying this will never, ever go forward if we don't have men and women well trained in the scriptures, according to our understanding of the scriptures. According to the rabbis, if you want to start a synagogue in a small little village, what do you do? What, what's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you get? Well, that's, you're close, but not, the first thing you get is a Torah scroll. Second thing you get is a Ner Tamid. Third thing you get is a mikvah. Okay? Fourth thing you get is a rabbi. You still haven't got a building, by the way. Right? You don't need a building. Yeah, well, they'd have to build an ark, but that's all that goes along with it. Or they have a Sephardic style that has the wooden case around it, which was used by the Ashkenazic too, which works as a, as a Aharon, uh, you know, yeah, Rona Kodesh um, by itself. At any rate, all I'm saying is that every movement that has made success has said we cannot neglect the need for understanding and for academic excellence in order to be a foundation for what we're doing. So don't be sidetracked by peripheral issues. I'll talk more about how we can, uh, some tests for what to believe and what not to believe. What's the first one? Calendar disputes. Now, we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much for this. It was the same thing going on in the first century, right? Every time we've ever had the uh, history of Jewish people, we find out that calendar issues have generally been disputes. But, yeah, okay, you're right. Two Jews, three opinions, four synagogues. Um, that, I mean, that's the old shtick, right? Okay, but there, there, in fact, were competing calendars in the first century. The Pharisees owned the majority calendar. The Sadducees had a minority calendar, and I put a question mark because we're not even sure it was a minority calendar. They basically only disagreed on the ruling of Shavuot, as far as we, as far as we can tell. The Essenes, the Dead Sea Scroll community, certainly had a sectarian calendar. They did not intercalate their calendar. Do you know what I mean by inter intercalate? If you take a purely lunar calendar, you slip behind some 11 days a year, okay, over a period of time. Okay, so if you have three years, you're off a month. If you have, uh, if you have a year, you're off a month. Uh, three years, you're off a month. If you have nine years, you're almost off a season, right? We're supposed, according to the Torah, to celebrate Pesach in the spring. It says that very clearly. So how did, they didn't even inter intercalate their calendar. What did they do? Nobody knows. They presumed that the end was that near, that uh, it, it was going to be over and things were going to be taken care of or something like that. Um, what did Yeshua and his disciples, which calendar did they observe? I think it's very clear that they observed the majority calendar. People will disagree with me, but every time we find Yeshua and his disciples in Jerusalem for a festival, guess what? There's all kinds of people there. Now, what does that tell you? If they're in the city for a festival and there's throngs and throngs of people there, it means it's the majority. Okay? Why did they not want to take Yeshua out in public? Because they were afraid of a riot. Why? Because there were a few Essenes there? No. Because there were a few Sadducees there? No. Because there were a lot of people there. They were following the Pharisaic calendar. We see the same thing in the same chapter, Mark 14, 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Guess what? The Sadducees were businessmen. If they could have, they would have moved the Pesach uh, according to their reckoning, okay? But I guarantee you from all of the history that we know of from Eusebius or from Josephus, from the rabbinic literature, if some Jew came up to the temple with a lamb on the 13th of Nisan and said, I want you to slaughter my lamb a day early, what would they have said? They said, you gotta be kidding me. The Torah says on the eve of the 14th, in the twilight of the 14th, we're not allowed to slaughter you. Yeshua could not have eaten a Passover a day early. You say, well, maybe he slaughtered it himself. Well, then he broke Torah. Right? Is the last thing Yeshua would do break Torah? I don't think so. You say, well, maybe they were using a different calendar. Well, there you have it. They were using a different calendar. What are all the people doing there in Jerusalem?
It's clear that Yeshua observed the established Sabbath. Can somebody explain to me, I guess we don't have time, but can somebody explain to me, and I'm sorry I'm being so uh, pejorative here, but I just have to say it. Can somebody explain to me the nonsense of a lunar Sabbath? Does it, you know what I'm talking about? I get these emails all the time. What do you think about the lunar Sabbath? I'm thinking, what in the world are they talking about? Yeshua observed the established Sabbath. How do we know? The Bible tells us so. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. By the way, if there's anybody that ever lived in the world that didn't need to go to church, it was Yeshua. <laughs> and by the way, he didn't need to go to synagogue either. But look what it says. As was his custom. He made it a habit to be in synagogue on Shabbat. If he did it, and really didn't need to, then we better kick ourselves a second time when we're sleeping in, the, in bed and saying, oh, vey, it's the Shabbat, I don't feel like going and listening to that boring rabbi anymore. Uh, maybe I'll just stay in bed. No, get yourself up and do what Yeshua did. Make it a habit, a custom, to be with the people in the synagogue on the Sabbath. But he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So guess what? He went to the Sabbath the same time everybody else did. If it's good enough for Yeshua, should it be good enough for us? In Mark 3, it says they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath day so that they might accuse him. What does that mean? That he was there on the Sabbath day and they considered it a Sabbath. They wouldn't have accused him if it was Tuesday. Nope. Right? So they were waiting to see. So he was there at the same time as they considered it to be the Sabbath. He observed Sukkot with the majority calendar. How do we know? It says in John 7, Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of Sukkot, was near. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up. He observed Sukkot just like everybody else. By the way, there's a whole bunch of, well, I don't know how many. Maybe there's a handful of people who think today is Shavuot. Did you know that? Yeah, today. Yeah. Isn't there a huge about that in the Mishnah? Uh, the question is, isn't there disputes about Shavuot in the Mishnah? Um, it's not really a dispute as much as it is, um, well, we don't have anything from the Sadducees because all we have is from the Pharisees. But, you know, when they're, when they're waving the sheaf or cutting the sheaf to wave, they said, should I cut now? Should I cut now? Should I cut now? Should I reap now? Should I reap now? Should I reap now? Whenever you see things three times in a row, it means it's an oath. Should I wave now? Should I wave now? Should I wave? Woe to the Bothusians. Why? Because they set signal fires to deceive people. What, what do they mean by that? Okay, signal fires were put on the mountains to alert everybody around, this is the beginning of the month, right? Well, the Bethusians, who were a sect of the Sadducees, counting things differently, went and would set signal fires at the wrong time to confuse people because they were counting the first of the month at a different time. And so we have those kinds of disputes. We don't seem to have any disputes amongst the Pharisees themselves. They were pretty much all on the same page when it came to calendar issues but there were disputes among other sects. Um, by the way, when Paul says, I am a Pharisee, not I was a Pharisee, do you think that meant that he kept the Pharisaic calendar? Of course. of course it does, because that was what identified, one of the things that identified a Pharisee. Oh, wait a minute. Wasn't he the apostle of Yeshua? <clears throat> um, yeah. If Yeshua and his disciples observed the majority calendar, this sets a good precedent for us. Don't become sidetracked with sighting of the moon, the ripe barley in Israel. How is it that two guys in Israel that nobody ever heard of before all of a sudden announce that they're the authorities for deciding when the month begins? I mean, I don't get it. What happened on the cloudy day? They did not see the moon. Yeah, what happened on the cloudy day? Of course. <laughs> what happened when the barley was ripe in the Tzeret, but it wasn't ripe in Yerushalayim? I mean, all of those kinds of things. And by the way, just so that, just so that you know, the Sanhedrin in the time of Yeshua did not make a decision based upon the sighting of the moon and the ripe har, uh, barley. They made the decision on other matters as well. For instance, I, I think I wrote a paper on this. If not, we'll find it and I can tell you. I can show you. Uh, I, the, the data is there. If the roads were washed out so that the pilgrims could, could not make it from the north country down to Jerusalem for Pesach, they, they added a month. If the lambing season had not come fully in place and there weren't enough lambs for the sacrifices, they added a month. It didn't matter if the barley was ripe. didn't matter whatever. 
Okay? If the bridges hadn't been rebuilt and were knocked out so that they couldn't, uh, people couldn't arrive to the city, they added a month. There was all kinds of reasons why they added a month. That first century, that's Sanhedrin, before the destruction. And, uh, uh, and also, <laughs> these, you know, it's because people have not read it, they haven't studied, they've, they've read internet uh, blogs about things, but they've never gone to the primary sources and read them. You say, well, I don't have the ability to do that. Hogwash. Everything that I'm talking about has been translated in English. You have access to it. Read it. Take your time. Do it. So, uh, I, I'm taking too much time on this. I go on. The Sadducean or the Essene calendar. Shavuot. Don't, don't waste your time on it. Until Yeshua returns, the standard Jewish calendar offers the best option for us. The standard Jewish calendar has as much claim to accuracy as other contrived calendars put forward by various individuals. What about sacred name issues? The reality is that we do not know how the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, was pronounced. Contrary to Nehemiah Gordon and others, we don't know. When somebody tells you that there's, a, there's an ancient manuscript that the rabbis have that they're not showing to anybody, they don't tell you what the name of the manuscript is, they say nobody can see it, but they have seen it. Oh, really? Sounds like Joseph Smith to me. And uh, <laughs> uh, they, they, they have seen it, and, and, and the pronunciation of the name is there, clearly. You say, well, okay. Until you tell me the name of this manuscript, take, you've had a chance to see it? Yeah. Can you go in and see it again? Yeah. Just take out your cell phone. Take a picture of it and email it to me. That's all you have to do. None of those ancient manuscripts are pointed. I don't know how to pronounce it. Precisely. The Masoretes adopted a, a perpetual Karekatib for the Tetragrammaton. Okay. What, do you understand what I mean by this? I, I shouldn't even ask that. I'll explain it. Kare means to read. Kativ means to write. Okay? So the rabbi said, it's written this way, but we want you to read it this way. And they put what you're supposed to read in the margin. But here's another thing they would do. They would put the vowels of the word they want you to read under the letters of the word that they write. This is how they noted a kare kativ. Anybody who was familiar with the Hebrew would say, that's not spelled right. That word's not spelled right. Exactly. Oh, it's not spelled right. Why is it not spelled right? Because I'm supposed to take the vowels, look over in the margin and say, oh, I'm supposed to pronounce a different word than the word that's written. Now, every time you came to yod heh vav -Hey, you were either supposed to say Adonai or Elohim. They put the vowels of the word to read under the consonants of the, uh, of the tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey. Okay. Here's Adonai, the substitute for the name of God. The first vowel is a chad of patach, is, is patach plus shiva. So actually the first vowel is shiva. Two dots, one on top of each other. Okay? The last vowel is chametz. Okay? So guess what we find? We find yod heh vav -Hey, and how is it written? The shiva under the first letter, the chametz under the vav. Okay? This does not tell you how to pronounce the name. It means, say, Adonai. Sometimes they gave you all three of the vowels. The Shiva, the Cholom, and the Hametz. By the way, this is how the Germans came up with Jehovah. Jehovah. It's the consonants of one of the name of God with the vowels of the word Adonai. It's called a misnomer. Okay? There's no such word as Jehovah. Of course. But they but there is in the J in German is a yes sound. So when they wrote Jehovah, they pronounced it Yehovah. You know, right? Just like Yesu. They did the same thing. Yeah, well, br bring them in. Show them your Hebrew Bible, ask them to show you what they're what they're saying. Okay. Or it can have the full first vowel, the uh, the chad of uh, patach, and the last vowel. So these are the three ways that the name of God is written in the Masoretic text with the vowels. The vowels are the vowels of Adonai. Okay. Now, occasionally they want you to the scribes wanted you to say the, the, the name Elohim when you came to Yod Hey Why would they do that? 
Because, for instance, in 2 Samuel 7 and other places, we have an interesting combination, first found in Genesis 15, and it's the combination of the word, the Hebrew word Adonai, followed by the Tetragrammaton. Adonai yod heh vav heh. And usually in your English translations, it's translated Lord God, with God all in capitals. Okay? Well, if you're reading in the scroll and you say Adonai, and then you come to yod heh vav heh, and you substitute Adonai, it doesn't sound right. Adonai, Adonai? Right? It's, it's two different names, but you're using the same word for both. So they said, now we substitute Elohim. Okay, so the first vowel is Chad of Segel, the, se the last vowel is Chirik, and that's what we find when we look at the Masoretic text. yod heh vav -Heh is with the first vowel, the Shiva, and the last vowel, Chirik, or with the complete first vowel and the vowel, Chirik, or with all of the vowels, Shiva, Cholom, and Chirik. Yeah, Yehovi. Now, when you find somebody on the internet saying, I don't know why these why why you're afraid to pronounce the name of the Yod Hey Vav Hey. Uh, it's there, right there in the Hebrew text. It has the vowels and everything. Okay, so which one are you going to choose? Besides that, these are the vowels not of the name; they're vowels of a different word. Now, somebody might say, "Well, Tim, is is that why you don't pronounce the name?" Yes, I don't know. I don't pronounce the name because I don't know how. If Queen Victoria were to come to our house, not that we're British, but we don't have any, you know. I wanted to use some very important to prestigious political person in our country, but I couldn't think of one. So um, I, I, just, I, just used, I, I just used Queen Victoria. Okay, so if Queen Victoria, if Queen Victoria comes to our house, and by the way, that would be a great privilege for my wife because she loves to collect teapots, uh, English teapots and tea and teacups. She has a very nice collection. Yeah, we regularly, she regularly hosts tea for ladies and for young ladies in our house and so forth and so on. And so with, if Queen Victoria came, oh boy, we would, we would sit down and have tea. We would have good British tea. Now, if she didn't know how to pronounce Victoria, she, was, uh, she didn't know. She just, let's just presume she didn't know. She wouldn't say uh, uh, Queen Wicketika. And she would be scared to death to mispronounce her name. So what would she say? She would say, Your Highness, Your Majesty. Majesty. Until, until she understood exactly how to pronounce the name. Well, if it would be true for an earthly queen or an earthly king, how much more it should be true for the heavenly king? Why would I want to go around mispronouncing his name? They say, well, he understands. Yeah, he understands. You treat him like a commoner or less. I know what his name is. His name is Elohim. His name is El. His name is El Shaddai. His name is Yah. I have all of those names which I can pronounce and be assured that that's how they're supposed to be pronounced. I don't know how to pronounce Yod Heh So I substitute according to our traditions Adonai or Elohim. Since the consonants Yod, Hey, and Vav, which make up the four letters, are Matris Lexionis, we cannot know for sure how the name was pronounced anyway. <laughs> Matris Lexionis literally means um, the mother of the sound, the one that carries the sound. Okay, let me explain. I haven't time, let me sum up. Yod, He, and Vav are Matris Lexionis, meaning what? At that stage of the language, before the vowels were written, the vowels were added by dashes, which you saw, or dots, or those kinds of things, right? We call them Nikudot. Those are the pointing that indicate the vowels. Before the pointing was created and written, there needed to be a way to indicate that there was a vowel, particularly at the end of the word. So, na'ar means what? And na'ara means young maiden. But there was no way to put the a ah at the end of na'ara. Because you didn't write vowels. So you couldn't ever distinguish between na'ar and na'ara. So what did they say? We'll put a hey at the end, and that will stand for a vowel. You don't pronounce the hey. It's not na'ara. No, it's, it's na'ara. And so the a ah at the end tells you it's a young woman as opposed to na'ar, which is a young man. How did they, how did they uh, write it? With a hey. So the hey stands for the vowel. That's what matris lexionis means. That's why yod stood for a hirik, right? And a vav stu, uh, st stood for a shuruk, I mean a, a, kibu, a shuruk or a cholam, right? So, are these yod heh vav heh, are they consonants or are they vowels? 
I don't know. Neither do you. If anyone tells you that they know for sure how to pronounce the, uh, the uh, sacred name, would you please just tell them, great, I want you to call Tim. Give him my number and just call me. Because, and I won't say a thing. I said, great, I'm, I've been waiting for this for years. Please tell me and explain how. Okay, some have suggested, and even some of the Kabbalists have suggested that yod heh is a feminine side of God. Um, but even more than that, to call upon the name of the Lord does not mean to pronounce his name. To call upon the name of the Lord means to, to uh, uh, call upon the God of Israel, recognizing who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised to do for those who trust in him. Why do I say that? Because in the Hebrew perspective, your name is who you are. It encompasses what you have done. Okay? So when you call upon the name of the Lord, which name are you going to use? El Shaddai, El Elyon, Yah, El, Elohim. Which one are you going to use? Well, that's not the point. The point is that all of those names, including yod heh vav even though we don't know how to pronounce it, reveal to us the character of God. It's the character of God we call upon. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. He always, you know, this shows the difference between a Greek and a Hebrew perspective. When the, when the emerging Christian church came to itself, they began to form creeds. What did they do? Their creeds related to the attributes of God. What were the attributes of God? He's omniscient. He's eternal. He's infinite. He's good. He's holy, so forth and so on. Well, those are all th true things. There's nothing wrong with saying that. But why won't you find a list of attributes like that amongst the early rabbis? Because that's not how the Tanakh speaks. When, when, <laughs> when they asked Jonah, which God do you serve? He didn't say, I serve the eternal, omnipotent, all-present, omniscient God. He said, I serve the God who made heaven and earth. <laughs> they go, oh, we're in trouble. We happen to be in the sea and things aren't good. <laughs> he must be mad at us. Okay, good point. So, what about somebody who is, who is unable to speak? Can he call upon the name of the Lord? I mean, this idea that unless you pronounce the name of the Lord correctly, God's not going to hear you, is magic. Don't be taken in by it. It's from the pit. It's a formula. It's, a formula. it's from the... It's, it's, it, it's the same thing that Israel tried to do to say, guess what? If we take the ark out to the battle, God will have to come with us. We will force God to give us victory. So if I pronounce the name of God right, he has to answer me. That's not what, that's, that's idolatry. You know what the essence of idolatry is? That you think you can control the God you pray to. You know, you put food out for him so he'll come near. You make a statue of him because he's, you know, he's arrogant. He's going to come and look at the statue and see if it looks like him. You put all these things near... <laughs> I, I know you laugh, but it's exactly the truth. If you, look, if you study ancient Near Eastern history, you discover that they made pictures of their gods so that the gods would come close to them because the gods like to look at themselves. You put food out and so forth and so on. If you think you can control God by pronouncing his name this way or that way, you've missed the whole idea of worship. Worship is bowing before a God who is great and almighty and saying, I have no right to ask anything of you, but if you will be merciful to me, please hear my, hear my prayer. Yes, Carla. Point. Let, let, uh, Carla, I'll just repeat it. Carla is saying that, you know, there are those who are teaching that when, when they translated Lord or when they translated God or whatever, that they were, they were changing the name. And since the scriptures clearly say don't add or take away from the scriptures, they were transgressing the scriptures themselves when they did that. And so their motive was to revert to what the Bible says, and their motive was not to try to be magic or something like that, but that once the, their motive, even if we say it was wrong, their motive was pure. Okay, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you on that, but I would say that that, is, that that idea comes out of a misunderstanding, a bad, a bad scholarship. Immediately, if somebody said that to me, I would say, well, was Paul transgressing the scriptures when he wrote theos in Greek for Elohim? Or when he wrote kurios in Greek for yod heh vav -Heh. Because he does. He quotes the Tanakh that uses the four-letter name of God. And when he quotes it, he quotes it in Greek and writes kurios. Kurios was the common Greek word for Lord. Did he change the scriptures? Apparently not. His words are inspired. 
Right? The Spirit of God inspired them. So immediately somebody, I would say, you haven't thought through this. <laughs> a translation isn't a changing of the Word of God. Okay, but good point, very good point. So uh, translations, this brings us right to the next point. Translations of the divine names in Scripture are not pagan. Jesus, God, Lord, Christ, those are not pagan, I'm sorry. Anyone who says that Jesus is related to Zeus has not done any study in language. They don't understand. They don't know. That includes Lou White. Books like Fossilized Customs are full, are full of misinformation, as was Hislop's Two Babylons. Hislop's Two Babylons, from the day that it came out, was, was, told, was said to be total rubbish by the academic scholars. What happened? Uh, the publishers continue to publish it and publish it and publish it and publish it and publish it. It's on the internet. Everybody refers to it. It's full of misinformation. Bad readings and misinformation. Fossilized customs, I think, is even worse. Don't be sidetracked by crazy, teaching crazy Hebrew. <laughs> I, I'm going to go through this too quickly because we need to finish. I know you're all tired and, and, uh, and uh, probably hungry. But have you heard of this, uh, this outfit uh, has a website? I don't want to besmirch anybody's name, but the, the website is ancienthebrew.com or .org or something like that. Uh, it's almost as bad as Hebrew for Christians, um, that site. Uh, please, 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 please. They're, this is what they're teaching. They're teaching that the shape of the Hebrew letters reveals the meaning of the words in which they occur. Now, the Kabbalists are big on this. If you're into Kabbalism, you like this stuff. But... It, it has absolutely no reality in substance. For instance, as an example, excuse me, as an example, Aleph means ox, and that's because originally in Paleo Hebrew, the sign for Aleph was the head of an ox, the symbol of strength. Bet means house. That's because originally the uh, in the Paleo Hebrew, the bet was made to resemble kind of the shape of a house. Okay, so they say. Therefore, when you see the word Av, which is made up of these two letters, Aleph and Bet, it means, it, it's actually the word Father, it means the one with strength in the house. And everybody goes, wow, that's really cool. Man, that's neat. That's like, that really tickles my ears. I mean, I didn't know there were all these secrets in the Hebrew letters. Okay. Well, guess what? All of this is, of course, total nonsense. Given the example above that Av means one with strength in the house, what would the Hebrew word Ba mean? I'm just switched the letters, right? Because it's the verb to go. House of the ox? I mean, you cannot take these kinds of ideas and have any consistency throughout the language of Hebrew. Somebody is dreaming. Somebody has a great, a very big imagination and putting it on the website and people are eating this stuff up like crazy. Why? Because nobody has told them to ask questions. The word, the, the word body house, the exactly. Which is what I go on to say. Hebrew writing or the shapes of the letters changed over time as well as from region to region. What, what Abraham was writing, and yes, I believe he wrote, didn't look anything like what Moses wrote and certainly didn't look like what, what like Isaiah wrote. So which one has the meaning? Which one has the divine meaning? And the other thing is, languages that evolve from pictograph to al alphabet lose all connection with the earlier pictographic stage of the language. What do I mean by that? Some languages we know started out by simply drawing pictures. When you wanted to do the word, of an, uh, the word house, you drew a house. When you wanted to uh, uh, write the word ox, you drew a picture of an ox. But eventually that became too cumbersome, right? Okay, so then they, as it evolved into letters, that gave the sound of the word that you're trying to write, they continued to use the pictures that you began with the letter you want to use. So because the, the letter bet originally meant bite, house, it started with b, so that became the picture for the letter sound b. It didn't, it loses all connection to the word house. Here's, a, here's another good example. Or I'll just say this, in the evolution from pictograph to al alphabet, the initial sound, letter of the pictograph, becomes the dominant aspect. Okay, so let me give you an example. For instance, if the English letter M derives from an ancient pictograph of water, which it may well do, Semitic Mayim, okay, and most people think that 
English letters derived from Sanskrit, which have some der derivation from Egypt, Egyptian and so forth. And you have the same Semitic idea of Mayim like you have in, in Hebrew. So M, and you could kind of see M as like a wave, right? Okay. Does this suggest that all English words that contain the letter M have some connection to water? The last time you wrote a note to your mom, were you thinking to yourself, mom, water, mom, water? Of course not. That's nonsense. Water may have been used to denote the phoneme M because in some of the Semitic languages the word for water begins with that sound. But the shape of the Hebrew letters has nothing to do with the meaning of the word in which they are found. Don't try to find secrets in Hebrew words. You don't need to try to find secrets. There's plenty in the plain meaning we don't understand. Work on that first. <laughs> or how about the latest, greatest Bible translation? Beware of Bible translations done by an individual. I would never, ever, ever translate the Bible myself. Do you realize that there are people who are going to make life decisions based upon the Bible they're reading? Do you realize that most cults have derived from Bibles that were poorly, poorly translated. A worthy translation of the Bible requires excellent knowledge of the original languages, understanding of textual criticism, and ability to work in comparative Semitics and linguistics. Even the best committees admit that they, they offer their translation with fear and trepidation. Why would anybody be arrogant enough to think that they could make their own translation? Accurate translations are best produced by a team of scholars, not by a single individual. Check out the credentials of the translators. I don't know if you've all heard of this, uh, what is it called? The Aramaic New Testament or the New Aramaic New Testament or something. And on the website, it's touted as the most, the oldest manuscript of the, of the uh, Gospels and the oldest manuscript of the, uh, of the New Testament and the most accurate. Well, it's translated by somebody by the name of Andrew Gabriel Roth. I have sought and sought and sought, even contacted him to try to get what his credentials are. Nobody knows. All he says is that he's a scholar. Well, most scholars aren't afraid to put their Vita up somewhere and say, this is where I went to school, this is who I studied under, and so forth and so on. Um, I've read through parts of this, and I find all kinds of mistakes. Don't be, don't be snookered into the latest, greatest uh, Bible translation. thinking that you're going to find what you're otherwise not finding. Translations of translations are not a worthy enterprise. For instance, Franz Dalich, who was a very good scholar back in the early 1900s, translated the New Testament into Hebrew. There are people now who are translating his translation into English. And doing wrong. And doing wrong. <laughs> you're right. You're exactly yeah, I know, I know. There's all kinds of mistakes in it. And they're saying, and they're saying this is the most accurate... This is the most, this is, if you want to study the, the Gospels from a Hebraic perspective, this is the Bible you need. Don't waste your money, okay? Uh, Stern's Bible is as good as any, and if you, if you, you know, I mean, if you want, if you want something for, that has Yiddish in it, go for it. I know, of course, that's what I said. I said, if you want Yiddish in your Bible, you can buy Stern, okay? So, uh, I mean, okay, we're being a little, we're being a little, uh, you know, joking here, but, but I will just say this. The ESV, the NASB, even the NIV, I mean, I know that some feel that they're NIV positive, but, uh, uh, um, but any, any, of the, any of these translations have been done by good scholars. They're going to have a prejudice. They're going to have a prejudice in a theology. We would expect that, right? Guess what? The things I write have a prejudice in my theology. You all know that. So you have to say, well, okay, this is, we know this is what Tim believes, and, and he's going to keep uh, talking about that. Okay, fine. So, but take these Bibles. They're done by uh, good scholars, and use them, and, and even better, learn to work in the Hebrew and the Greek. And if you can't work in the Hebrew and the Greek, get an inner linear. Get a computer where you can start looking to see what are the Greek words behind this, that, and the other. And by the way, there are no Hebrew manuscripts of the apostolic scriptures extant. None. Zero. Nada. Very late manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew, 14th and 15th century, have been found, like the Shem Tov, the Deuteroleum, or the Munster, but these are most likely translations of the Greek into Hebrew. They are not original manuscripts. Don't be snookered by somebody who goes around saying, I have the earliest manuscript of Matthew. Guess what? He does not have the earliest manuscript of Matthew, and everybody knows it, as he does, too. He, if he were honest, he would tell you that. 
To say that the apostolic scriptures were originally written in Hebrew is entirely speculative and finds no clear consensus among the scholars. Why in the world would Paul write a letter to Ephesus in Hebrew? They built, they built the whole yeah, they built a whole school, the, the Jerusalem school for the study of the Synoptic Gospels. It's, and so what happens? They say, well, we don't have the Hebrew manuscripts, so we take the Greek manuscripts, we retranslate them back into Hebrew as we think it might have been, and then we make all of our judgments based upon our translation, which we think might have been. That's very circular. All right. Some rules we're going to end with for identifying junk, junk scholarship. Test number one. Does the author supply supporting evidence? First rule. When, when I teach students, I don't care whether it's at our synagogue or whatever, in the yeshiva, I say, look, if you hear somebody make a credible, an incredible claim, you know, you know um, Yeshua always ate bagels on Shabbat. And, and you say, okay, where did you read that? Where did you hear that? And they don't give you any supporting evidence for it. Say, I don't believe it. I'll believe it when you show me, when you show me the evidence. Does the author give sources to substantiate his or her claims? If not, be very careful. Without the sources, you can't check to see if the author is giving you something he hopes is true, just an opinion, or an educated guess. If it sounds too incredible, it probably is. For example, on Focus on the Family, April 1999, an article by Ray Vanderland, wonderful man, no problem, regarding ancient customs and Jewish weddings. Have you heard this one? After reaching an agreement uh, uh, upon bride price between the bride's father and the groom-to-be, the custom was, quote, from the young man's father to pour a cup of wine and hand it to his son. His son would turn to the young woman, lift the cup, and hold it out to her, saying, This is a new covenant in my blood which I offer to you. In other words, I love you, and I'll give you my life. Will you marry me? By drinking the cup, it was the bride's way of saying, I accept your offer, and I give you my life in response. When I read that, I thought, fantastic. I mean, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. That's exactly what Yeshua said, right? How come I never saw this? I mean, how did I miss this? So I, I looked down at the bottom of the page to see where the source is, and there's no source. So I started looking on the internet. I, I bought a book by Richard Booker, who has the same thing in it. I thought, no sources. So I said, okay, I'm going to call Vander, Vanderland and see what he says. So I called him. wasn't there. Got his secretary. I said, listen. I need to get the information where this is because this is really fantastic. She said, okay, I'll tell him. I've got it written down. I've got your number and everything. I'll let him know. He's a very busy man, but he'll get back to you. I said, okay, never got back to me, never got back to me. I understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm accused of the same thing. So I sent a fax. I said, dear Ray, really appreciate your work, really appreciate what you've written. I need the data that you got this from. Was it from uh, Josephus? Was it somewhere in the rabbinic literature? I can't find it anywhere. I want to use this. This is great stuff. Didn't hear back from him, didn't hear back from him finally sent a registered mail that he had to sign, right? Got his signature back, yep, he got it. Called him up, said, what can I do? Can you give me this stuff? He said, to be honest with you, I don't know what the source is. It doesn't have a source. I've heard this repeated time and time and time again on the internet. It's total, total fabrication. Doesn't exist, didn't ever happen. Don't be sucked in by people who teach you things and don't give you sources where they found their information. Test number two, does the author give primary or secondary sources? You might say, well, yeah, this guy gives all kinds of sources. What kind of sources does he give? What is a primary source? It means an ancient text an author's actual, or an author's actual work. In other words, if you're writing something about Plato and you put as a footnote some, such and such as blog where he writes about Plato, that's not a primary source. That's a secondary source. He might be right, he might be wrong. If you're talking about Plato, go to the works of Plato, tell me what book, tell me what chapter, tell me what paragraph you're talking about, and then I can go check it out and see if I like your interpretation. A secondary source is someone's comments on a primary work. Example, when someone says that the Mishnah teaches X or Y, do they quote the Mishnah to substantiate their claim or do they quote someone else who is interpreting the Mishnah? Okay, so what would a primary source be like? As we find in Mishnah Sanhedrin 
Okay? So then you go, you find Mishnah Sanhedrin, you look at 10.1, you see if you like the way the author has interpreted it. All right? Here's a secondary source. This is, of course, tongue-in-cheek. The Mishnah teaches salvation through works. Here's the footnote. Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1, as quoted from Dr. Somebody, why the Jews are wrong in his newsletter, I'm Always Right, April 1, 1995. <laughs> now, you, you, you know, I mean, you may look down at the bottom of the page or at the end notes and say, well, he's, he's got some source there, but if, if it's not a primary source, it's, you still have to check it out doubly, right? The person that he quoted might be way off the wall. Just because someone wrote it in a book or published it in a newsletter or taught it at a conference does not necessarily make it true. The question is, are there primary sources to substantiate what is being taught? Hold the teacher's feet to the fire. You deserve to do that, and he deserves to have it done. Third test, do the sources provide actually, provided actually support the author's thesis? I mean, anybody can put a bunch of footnotes down at the bottom. The question is whether they have any relevance to support what he or she has said. Check the author's sources. Look them up in the primary documents. Here's an example. Out of uh, Ron Mosley's book, Synagogue Functionaries in the Local Church. I actually called him on this one, too, some years ago. Example, the Nasi, which means president in, uh, in uh, rabbinic Hebrew, was the administrator of the synagogue. We know that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the Nasi of the early church at Jerusalem. Really? How do we know that? Early documents such as the Didache suggest that the churches in Asia Minor and Greece treated the church at Jerusalem with much the same authority as the synagogues did the Sanhedrin. And he references the edition of Didache made by Hitchcock, chapters 8 and chapters 11 through 15, and he, and he references Eusebius History, uh, book 3, uh, section 25, chapter 4. Okay, guess what? If you're fortunate, as I am fortunate, I happen to have all those in my library. So I get up from my desk and I go look. Dedekai 8 teaches about fasting and praying. Dedekai 11 describes false prophets and what to do with them. Dedekai 12 describes how to receive a traveling teacher. Dedekai 13 describes true prophets and teachers and admonishes the people to give the true prophet the first fruits. Dedekai 14 describes the breaking bread as a sacrifice or Eucharist. And Didache 15 admonishes the people to establish bishops and deacons and to conduct themselves according to the gospel of our Lord. Here's what Eusebius says in his chapter, book 3, chapter 25, and section 4. It talks about which books of the Bible are genuine, which are to be rejected. Nothing whatsoever is said about the role of James, the authority of the Jerusalem church, or anything to suggest that the Jerusalem church was viewed as a messianic Sanhedrin. None of these sources substantiate anything he said in that paragraph. Another example, Bacha Wooten in Who is Israel, page 44. In its second meaning, Jezreel, the name Jezreel, and then footnote 73, speaks of the blossoming forth of those once hidden like a seed, the emphasis being on the seedling's response, ana, to answer. Meaning, one day, Ephraim's scattered seed would begin to heed to pay attention to the Father and his word. And then she, she uh, puts down hidden ones, but there's no biography anywhere to tell us what is hidden ones. Who's the author? Well, I mean, is this some book or some pamphlet? We don't know. And she quotes a bunch of Psalms in Colossians 3.3. These references have no mention of Jezreel, nor do they give any information on a second meaning of Jezreel. I mean, it totally has nothing to do with what she says in the paragraph. I wrote her an email and never got back. Okay. Um, test number four. Does the author base his or her conclusions on supposed similarities? Here's the principle. Similarities do not prove same origin. Okay? Suggested hypotheses only. Yes. Suggested hypotheses only. Right. Example from Lou White. Page nine. While explaining that our word Wednesday originated as the day commemorating the Celtic god Wotan, White writes, Wotan's em emblem was the Celtic crux, a cross with a circle, which he takes to mean the sun. No wonder we see so many pictures of crosses with the sun nimbus behind it and sunsets in Christian art, not to mention the halos of yellow around the heads of Jesus and the saints. Guess what? An art piece with a sunset may have nothing to do with the Celtic god Wotan. Probably doesn't, in fact. Just because the pagans use something does not necessarily mean it has pagan origins. It is the way of the enemy to counterfeit what God has given. If you follow Lou White's uh, uh, logic, then you would have to say the name L, as in 
El Shaddai, right, which is used of the true God of Israel. Guess what? El was the chief God of the Canaanites. He was also called El. So should we stop using El because it refers to a pagan God in Canaan? In, in, in around 3500 BCE? Example, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant as God's dwelling place. The Canaanite god El also dwelt in a tent and had a footstool for his feet, which was a chest or an ark, which had sacred items in it. So, oh, should the Israelites have started saying, oh, the ark is pagan. Wait a minute, which one came first? Similarity does not necessarily prove the same origin. How do we decide what is truly of pagan origins and what the pagans have taken over that originally belonged to God's people? How do we decide? Well, here's my litmus test. Has God commanded it? Then we must follow his commands and not be afraid to express worship to him as he has directed. Has God favored it? Then we should receive it as well. For instance, the presence of God fills Solomon's temple even though there was no command to build it. You know God never commanded Solomon to build his temple? And you know that he never said how he should build it? And in fact, he built it twice as big as the, uh, in dimensions as the, uh, as the t uh, tabernacle? And God didn't say he did anything wrong? So if God favors it, it's okay. And I'll, I will extend that to what, if Yeshua did it, I can do it. Right? Okay. Has God forbidden it? Then we should have no part of it. For instance, using worship places developed by pagan religions in the worship of God, such as utilizing the high places for worship. I, I think it's a tragedy that people are um, uh, all of a sudden adopting yoga as a way of uh, meditating uh, on the spiritual things. I, I, I think it's mixing things that essentially differ. You don't need yoga to do that. No, I'm not talking about stretching. You, you say, well, this person's stretching and it looks like yoga. Well, I don't care if it looks like yoga. It may not be yoga. But what I'm talking about is meditating and breathing in and breathing out in certain positions and everything like that and then saying I'm using this as, as a spiritual exercise to come close to God. You don't need that to come close to God. Guess what? If you needed that, the Bible would have told you about it. Okay, test number five. Has the author relied only on a translation of the Bible rather than working in the original languages? Much good teaching can come from study of the Bible in translation. I'm not denying that. However, only studying the Bible in translation has its difficulties because one is dependent upon the translator's understanding and interpretation of the text. Example, some have claimed that the book of Hebrews contains many errors and should therefore not be received as the inspired scripture. For instance, some author wrote about Hebrews 8.13, the old covenant, where it says the old covenant is obsolete and passing away. He said, clearly that could not be written by someone who had any knowledge because we know that the Torah never passes away. Well, guess what? The word covenant's not in that verse. He just didn't look at his Greek. He only looked at his English translation. He did the same thing in Hebrews 9.1 regarding the phrase first covenant, a reference to the Torah. He says, this guy, whoever wrote this, doesn't know what in the world he's doing because the, the, the Torah is not the first covenant. The first covenant is the Abrahamic covenant or the Noahic covenant. In fact, the, Abraham, the, the Torah must be the third covenant. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Well, guess what? The word covenant's not in there. It's not in the original. What is more, the Greek word that is translated first can just as well mean former. Protos can mean former. It can be first. In Hebrews 9, the Torah is called a last will and testament, but it never was this, the author says. He says, this guy's really mixed up. He doesn't understand covenants as a whole. However, the Greek does not describe a last will and testament, but the ceremony of covenant making in the ancient world, which fits perfectly with the language of the text. So, 2 Timothy 4.3 says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. What does that mean? I want to find something new. I want to find something. Say, wow, I've never heard that before. If that's what we're trying to produce is the wow factor, we're in trouble. They will accumulate to themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. We live in a time of sensationalism. Teachers that are always trying to come up with the hidden nuggets that no one else has found are peddling shiny plastic trinkets. They're not going to last. 
the kind of stuff you tell your kids they can't buy at the fair because you know it's just going to come home and go in the trash can. Some traveling seminars are big on hype and short on substance and make fantastic claims that sound truly appealing at first. For example, uh, someone's going around saying that a 15th century copy of Matthew in Hebrew is not, is not the last day's, well, I should say, he's saying it's the last day's treasure and I'm telling you it's not. It does not lo unlock all the mysteries of the gospel. A slick salesman tells the buyer what he wants to hear. Right? I mean, you learn this in sales class. Ask your client questions to discover what they want to buy. Then turn your product to meet their expectations. That's good salesmanship. As long as you don't fudge too much. Some of today's teachers are far better salesmen than teachers. Yeshua and his apostles did not come huckstering the gospel. They didn't come selling it, at, you know. They came with the power of the word of truth, energized by the word of the spirit, spoken through the lives of humility and dedication. So, some concluding. Don't be persuaded by word studies. Don't be fooled by conclusions based on etymologies of words. What do I mean by that? You can't find the true meaning of a word by tearing it apart. Okay, necessarily. I, yesterday I used the term fellowship. The, the, okay, the English word fellowship is made up of what two words? Fellow and, yeah, but actually it's not. Okay, ship is not there, okay? Ship is a ending from Middle English meaning regarding to or in regard to. Okay, as in craftsmanship. Okay, so it it's really doesn't have those two words, um, fellow and ship, in it, though it looks like it does. So you could have somebody come up with a wonderful teaching on why fellowship derived from people who had to live on ships a lot and had to get along together. <laughs> and you think, wow, that's really interesting. I never knew that before. If you go listen to, uh, if you go open up your Webster dictionary, you find out that's total nonsense. Before you believe something, make sure you have verifiable sources that support the premise you're espousing. Teachers who fail to offer the data of primary sources for their claims ought to be received with some amount of suspicion. Radical conclusions require a preponderance of proof. If it sounds too credible, it very well may be. Beware of out-of-date scholarship. Our understanding of ancient languages and cultures has been greatly enhanced in the last 50 years. Do you realize that the Dead Sea Scrolls have only been discovered like 60 years ago? We learned a lot from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Rashamra, the Ugaritic, peril, uh, the Ugaritic material, came in the 1950s. It, 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 we, we haven't had it that long. There's a lot that's been learned about ancient Near Eastern, East, uh, ancient Near Eastern languages, Semitic languages particularly. Think criti critically. Learn to ask questions. Good answers require good questions. Don't be afraid to, don't think, oh, it's wrong to question the teacher. No, make your questions reverent. I mean, you know, don't be haughty. But make your questions, and if you have questions, ask the questions. On what basis do you say this? Or could you explain to me why you think this is true? You stated it's true, I want to know more about that. Don't be afraid to ask questions and ask good questions. Don't, but don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Former generations of scholars have much to contribute to our understanding of the scriptures, even if their conclusions differ with ours. Some of the greatest scholars in that, that ha in biblical studies, uh, you know, are from the 18, 19, early 1900s. They really had a quality education. By the time they were 10 years old, they knew Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and probably French and German. At least, you know, to a certain extent. Okay, and I'm going to give you a Torah resource slide, and oh, I'll give you a verse. Yes, okay, question. Yes, the two Babylons by Hislop. It's it is not to be trusted from the time that it was uh, published until present. In fact, if you just do a Google, Google search on two Babylons, you'll come to a, a page, it's pretty high up on the Google search, where a gentleman, a pretty good pastor, um, decided that he wanted to reprint, or that he wanted to do a kind of book like two Babylons. So he kind of based his book on two Babylons and updated it. A year later, he started back to seminary, and he found out that everything he wrote in the book was nonsense because it was based on two Babylons, which is also nonsense. And he took it out of the market. He and he wrote a letter saying, "Don't read this. It's, it's lousy. It, 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 I realized that I did everybody a disfavor." 
The two Babylons makes uh, conclusions based upon very faulty study of the old Egyptian and old Akkadian and old Babylonian documents. And it was, it was discounted by scholars to, uh, when it first came out. And it was said that, well, the reason it was discounted because it's such a hard message against the church. No, it's discounted because he, he's made assumptions that aren't true in terms of the primary documents. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Sure. Okay, but I have a trump card. Yeshua. That, that's my trump card. All of your arguments I fully agree with and I, and I recognize the value of them. But the question is, what did Yeshua do? Did he follow the majority calendar? The answer is yes. It's quite clear. Okay, then I can say at least I have the right to follow the majority calendar on the basis of what he did. Did he think that the Sanhedrin was right in everything? Of course not. Did he think that the Pharisaic calendar necessarily was right in everything? I'm not sure. Maybe not. I would presume that at times he probably thought, well, they, they might be doing this for their own reasons. But he still followed it. We have zero indication that he did anything but follow the majority calendar of the Pharisees. Uh, and by the way, I personally think that Yeshua was far more aligned with the Pharisees than with any other sect of his time. You know, but he was an in-house Pharisee who was therefore able to have some pretty nose-to-nose -nose disputes. Okay, but that's my trump card to say, I'm looking at Yeshua and saying, what calendar did he follow? He followed the majority calendar. Now is the Hillel calendar, Hillel 2, that was, uh, that was finalized when? The 3, 311, is that right? Is that too late? I don't, I don't remember, it's in, in, in that area. Is the Hillel calendar, which now is the basis for the Jewish calendar, is that, is that a majority calendar? Yes, it is. How accurate is it? Well, frankly, it's very accurate. I mean, man, he did... I mean, they did a great job to come up with a 19-year cycle that keeps everything within hours of, of uh, a, a lunar solar calendar. I mean, it, it, it's... With, without a computer or, yeah, or a calculator, right. I mean, they, they were magnificent in that. And, do, you know, somebody will say, well, but you don't, you don't observe Rosh Kodesh, you know, it's, it's retarded a day or it's advanced a day or two or whatever. Okay, I understand. But the same thing happened in the first century when it was cloudy and they couldn't cite for sure that, or they didn't have witnesses that were credible that they cited the new moon. What did they do? They waited. So what happens if two days later they, they, they uh, cite the not-so-new moon? They say, oh, it was two days ago. Okay, so all I'm saying is that they had that variation in the first century too and I don't see Yeshua or any of the apostles saying, oh, 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 they're not obeying the Torah. It sounds to me like they went along with the Sanhedrin and, their, um, and this may be what Yeshua means when he says they sit in the seat of Moses, therefore do what they say, not what they do. I mean, there's a sense in which authority is to be followed as long as it isn't clearly contrary to the scriptures. And let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, Leviticus 23.11 and so forth is, is uh, uh, understood two or three different ways. And could it be understood two or three different ways? Yes, it could be. It could be. The Septuagint clearly made it, makes it clear by 300 of, the, of uh, BCE. Have you, have you read the Septuagint on Leviticus 23.11? The Septuagint makes it clear that the Pharisees are right. It says the day after the first day of the feast. So it, it, says, right, I mean, it, it says it right in the Septuagint. So as early as 300 BCE, as, as early as 300 BCE, it was already settled as far as the majority of the Jewish community was concerned that the Pharisaic calendar was right. That's, you know, 300 years before the coming of Yeshua, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay, the question is, is it clear that Yeshua himself used circumlocutions and are these preserved in the text? Um, we have difficulty in answering that. Number one, I would say, is it clear that he used circumlocutions? The answer is yes. He tells, for instance, the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the power from on high, you know. Um, most scholars, there are a few, there's a paper that was delivered two years ago at the ETS meeting, which I didn't think was all that uh, substantial, but almost other, all other scholars would say that kingdom of heaven, Malchut uh, HaShemayim, um, is a circumlocution. Um, did he pronounce the name? I don't think so. I know that there are those who say that that's why he was, you know, that's why the high priest ripped his garment and so forth. No, I don't think he pronounced the name. I think he used circumlocution. I think if he had pronounced the name, he would have been accused of that in the Gospels. He was accused of blasphemy. Now, wh what was blasphemy? And I commend to you Daryl Bach's book on blasphemy in the, in, in the first century, a great treatise on this subject. And basically, Daryl Bach, B-O-C-K. Um, 
uh, and he, I think, gives, I think he wins the day by saying that uh, his blasphemy was that he, he uh, confessed to be able to forgive sins. Your sins are forgiven you. Making himself equal with God. Yeah, that was blasphemy. Yeah, Lord. Okay. So l let me see if I can uh, repeat what you've said because otherwise I'll kind of lose it maybe. Okay, so with regard to the festivals and with regard to the calendar, I'm saying that Yeshua basically, I'm trying to follow what Yeshua did in the sense that Yeshua gave credence to the majority and so I feel free to, to give credence to the majority calendar as well. But the question then is, were the festivals all intended to be celebrated in the land and then if we're outside of the land, do we even have the obligation or should we even try to, to maintain the festivals outside of the land? Because of all this controversy. Which because of all the controversy. Okay, um, in a number of places with regard to the festivals, it says wherever you may reside. And here's my rule of thumb. Now, we have at least one individual in our shul that thinks that today is Shavuot. Okay, and she's probably celebrating Shavuot today. But... She, but she celebrated Shavuot with us last Tuesday night and all day Wednesday. And so her point is, I don't want to cause division. And I can keep a Sabbath under the Lord on this day in my house, and I can invite some others with me if, if I want to, which is fine. No problem. However, I think that when it, if, if I'm in the vast minority in a community, and the community says, this is when we're going to celebrate according to this calendar, I ought to, because I cannot say my calendar is more accurate than yours. I can't 100% say that. I should then say, I will go with the rest of you and celebrate with you. I don't want to be a division on the basis of a personal preference which has, which I can't prove is absolutely right. Okay. See, in other words, allow, allow the, the rule of love for your brother to be the deciding factor in a halakha, in a halakhic issue that is nebulous. He did that with the weaker brother too, precisely.